Great, so we go on with the, the second part of our program, and I'm very happy to welcome here with me uh, Joanna Moll. That is actually the second time that is she's speaking at the Disruption Network Club, because the first time happened in London, when we were doing our event uh, both uh, uh, at the Somerset House. And uh, so it's uh, a pleasure to <laughs> welcome you again, here, this time in Berlin. And I have to say that uh, the work that Joanna does uh, uh, connects pretty well with what we just saw on the screen. Uh, because even if she is not uh, a whistleblower in the sense we uh, consider this word, for sure I have to say that the works uh, Joanna does uh, uh, allows to understand better technology and culture we live in. And uh, since uh, also Christopher Wiley was saying that uh, it's very important how we consider the connection between culture and politics, because actually the way we understand culture can really affect uh, how politics is developed. I think that the work that Joanna does is very important uh, also because of that, so because you really allow people to understand uh, uh, what is behind uh, the interface, and not only the interface of technology, but also the interface of culture. And I think your work is pretty well an example uh, of literacy and how it's important to dig uh, into uh, um, our codes of both culture and technology to have a better understanding of the society we live in. So I'm pretty happy to welcome you <laughs> and also say that um, uh, Joanna is a Barcelona-based artist and researcher and uh, her main research topics include internet materiality, surveillance, social profiling, and interfaces. She is the co-founder of the Critical Interface Politics Research Group at Hangar in Barcelona, and also co-founder of the Institute for the Advancement of Popular Automatism. I really love this. <laughs> um, and the Today, uh, Joanna is going to present uh, uh, mainly two artistic projects. This morning, we already did a workshop with her that was called The Interface Deconstructed, in which really we dig into the design and the functionality of algorithms. And today, Joanna is going to present uh, two projects. One is called The Dating Brokers that she launched uh, last year, like one year ago. And one is a new project. Uh, named the hidden life of uh, an Amazon user. So now I leave the word to you, and uh, then we enter in our conversation. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Tatiana. I'm really, really happy to be here at Batania because London was great, but like this is like the disruption network lab base. So thanks a lot. Um, well, thank you everybody uh, to be here. Thanks. Um, so I'm going to speak about these two projects, which uh, they are very related to each other in a way. Well, that's what I did them after one after the other. So this one is, um, as Tatiana said, it's called Dating Brokers. It was uh, commissioned by Tactical Tech. Yeah, it's, uh, I guess most of you are familiar with it, but it's an NGO uh, based here in Berlin. And the whole thing started when I bought one million profiles, dating profiles, uh, for 136 euros yeah, in the open web. Uh, with these profiles, I've got 5 million pictures and very detailed information of every profile, like usernames, email addresses, very thorough uh, physical uh, description of the people, eye color, hair color, height, uh, gender, sexual orientation, uh, interest, uh, and so on. Yeah. And, well, I bought them here. Uh, this is the website. It's called USDATE. Org. We don't have much time, so I'm not going to visit the website, but you're very welcome to do it. Uh, you can buy a vast amount of dating profiles right now. You just need a PayPal account. That's all you need. You don't even need to go through Tor or through anything. It's completely available and legal. Yeah. So my first thought um, after I bought those profiles, yeah, well, this is an example of the sort of stuff that they sell. So they have like these data sets so of Latin American male profiles, uh, 111, well, um, more than 100 profiles. Also, these numbers are pretty strange, right? Because it's 111,000 
why not 100,000? I don't know. So $70. Yeah, 66,000 Latin America female profiles. $70. Uh, obviously, um, Latin America female profiles are more expensive for whatever reason. Uh, well, these are just totally random prices, right? But that's what they sell. There is also sugar daddy profiles. There's also like a golden membership database. There's also a uh, rich people profiles, which are obviously more expensive, and so on. So I started to dig in, in the practices of the online dating industry because I felt that it was ridiculous that I could buy this amount of profile just like that. And then, so I wonder, okay, maybe you know what's going on? Why, why is it uh, that I could do that, and everybody can do that? So apparently, like exchanging dating profiles among um, different dating sites, it's something that's quite um, quite uh, normal. It's a standard in the online dating business because they need, like all these sites, they need like a constant flow of new profiles yeah, in order to increase matchmaking possibilities and also just to make it look like the, uh, there is like fresh meat all the time. Yeah? And, and new people is there and there is like an attention and, and websites are not dead. Actually there is like all these services also, one of these called like white label dating, uh, that basically is sort of a content man management system for online dating sites where you get like all the design, you get like all the content man management system uh, behind the site, but also you get like uh, a lot of uh, different dating uh, profiles to pre-populate the site, yeah? So the standard package is around 20 to 60,000 profiles, yeah? Just like that. And these companies that allow you can use their services, but in return, every single profile that will sign up to your new uh, dating uh, business or dating website is going to go into a main database and they will reuse these profiles. Yeah, so it's like a never end story of sharing just dating profiles all over with whomever is using some of these uh, profiles, uh, websites. Yeah, there's also this one is another example. But for me, like, what was more critical is like, where were these profiles coming from? Uh, because I just got all this information and US state, uh, they wouldn't disclose where they got these profiles from. So this, for example, that's the example of our database. It's just like uh, some examples of the pictures. We've got uh, more than 600,000 uh, males and half females, more than around 300,000. Uh, and that's the CSV file that we've got along with all this information. Yeah, so all the data set that we, that we got, it was ready to be used in a website. Yeah? So it was like in this data set, uh, database format that we could easily implement it uh, if we would decide to do an online dating site. So I ran this, <laughs> I mean, I can't really call this forensics even, but I just ran like an Exif data software uh, uh, to these images. So for ones who are not familiar with this, like uh, Exif um, uh, software is, allows you to obtain metadata of any picture, like, like geolocation, if it's the case, like the type of camera you took the picture from, the date, and many other details. So the image on the right, it was part of our data set and I ran this Exif image software uh, with this picture, and I got not really relevant information, but I got this uh, title, which was image software, POF, and the number. And then I, I just started to think, wait, POF, POF? Well, it can be a thousand things, right? So I just obviously Googled POF dating site, and the first thing it appeared, plenty of fish. Yeah, so it's a, apparently, I didn't know the site, but it's a quite well-known uh, site, especially in the US. And then I went to Plenty of Fish, which is kind of a kinky name. Um, and I took one of the pictures I found in the data set, uh, in the, sorry, in their website, and I also ran it through Exif Image software, and I got this POF. Yeah? And of course, this wasn't conclusive, uh, conclusive but it, give, it gave me a hint. So the next thing I did, um, I just, uh, in uh, Plenty of Fish, you have like this feature in the website where you can look for um, for people, yeah? Which I think it tempts quite a lot against privacy, but okay, you can just look for any username. So I started to compare like uh, people I had in my data set and I tried to find them there. And indeed I found a lot, yeah? So this was some of the examples. So um, below 
Um, it's the uh, some information I had in my CSV that I got from US State. And this was the description of this person. I love fine well, we have to turn some videotapes, I love to roller skate, blah, blah, blah. So I found exactly the same. This above, it's a, a plenty of free screenshot of the profile of this person. Yeah? And uh, all that we analyzed, so I found quite a lot of, um, of matches. So this was quite a good hint. And the third hint, I was like, uh, I went to US State, I sent them an email and said, yo, I really want plenty of fish uh, dating profiles. Do you have some? And they answered, yeah, we have millions of it. We can sell you whatever you want. I said, well, all right. Yeah, so at least we can know for sure that a huge part of the dating profiles from our data set came from that website. Um, so the next obvious question was like, okay, what is Plenty of Fish? So Plenty of Fish, it's uh, originally a Canadian uh, website, and then it was acquired by Match Group, I uh, think, in 2015 for $250 million, which is not little. They claim to have um, 70,000 new singles per day, yeah, which is a lot. Um, and then I just went to Match Group, and apparently I didn't know Match Group, but Match Group is the biggest online dating uh, business in the world. They have brands like Tinder, like Match, like Mythic, like OKCupid, okay and, and many other quite well-known dating sites. And what I did is just to map all the conglomerate that was owned by Match Group, and I came across around 200 different uh, online dating sites. And looking at the privacy policy uh, back then, said that any profile that was created in any of the brands uh, within the match group uh, conglomerate could be used in any other service, yeah? So information was just shared across all the platform, yeah? Whether you signed for match or pairs or you didn't, right? So let's say that like you have a Tinder profile, you could easily, this information could be shared in OkinCupid, for instance, or many others, because there is a, was a lot of other very kinky sites that I found, like pet lovers, like, uh, I don't know, single, um, separated, black women uh, websites, I don't know, like all sort of very specific things and, and sort of religious stuff and, you know, like Christian to meet up and, and a lot of different things. But that wasn't all because then Match Group is a child company or sister company of Interactive Corp. No. So Interactive Corp is one of the biggest internet companies in the world, it's also American, and they own brands like uh, Vimeo, like the Daily Beast, like Daily Burn, Home Advisor. I'm not sure if Home Advisor is popular here in Germany, in Spain it's really not, but it's a huge, huge online uh, conglomerate of real estate. Um, there is also, like it includes Angie's List and, and some others, Verkspot is also quite huge. It's like a bus network of uh, contractors. Mm? So they have like a lot of very, very uh, powerful brands. Yeah? And again, as stated in the privacy policy of uh, Interactive Corp, any data shared across all the services can be also shared across any of the services belonging to the brand. Yeah? So here I could brand like another 150 brands yeah, that I could do, as probably there is even more, because it wasn't that easy to brand all the products of these people, because I didn't really publicly disclose it like, you know, in the website, so I had to dig in a bit. Um, and then there was like a third phase, which is about understanding all the third parties connected to all these uh, services, online services. Yeah? So it's online tracking, it's this process of collecting data in an anonymous way um, of the online activity of the user. Yeah? So basically everything that you can click or you can do or you can, anything that you can imagine you can do uh, on a website, it's being recorded and collected. Yeah? And I just run <coughs> some scripts that could identify all these third companies that they were sucking information out of uh, when you connect to any of those websites that I could map, which was a total of 400 already between Interactive Corp and, uh, and Match Group, and we could find more than 300 other connected companies that were just also selling, uh, sucking data. So at the end of the day, we had more than 700 interconnected services and companies that could capitalize in a single uh, profile that was done in any of these websites, yeah? And especially like, the ones that we bought. Yeah? And this is quite massive. And we just, this just accounts for desktop activity because we didn't uh, map uh, 
app uh, activity, yeah, because we couldn't and we felt that it wasn't relevant. So the project is the following. So, oops, this one. Yeah, well, internet, we are just using SARS hotspot <laughs> here. So we just developed this system of auctions. Um, well, there should be some pictures here. Okay, there, yeah, that's it. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so we just developed, it's a very, I mean, really, it's a very silly project in the way it looks. So it's like auctions and we just uh, showed, we create a, like random segments of people, clusters of people, which at the end is like how all these dating bro data brokers are selling their data. So for example, this we have 308 women that have children, married style single, sexual orientation, heterogender, female. Yeah, and then you can just access here. Every two minutes we have a new one, and then you can access all this data set of that matches to this cluster. Yeah, and here you can access like most of the information, well, uh, that's because of the internet. Um, this should be full of stuff. It always happened like that when I present it publicly. <laughs> Something goes wrong all the time. But uh, yeah, but you know, you can understand it. We tried to anonymize everything we could. There is no usernames, there is no emails, and, and we faked a lot of stuff. Uh, but it's just to understand what lays beyond like this uh, dating, uh, this data broker industry, right? Which uh, that's how basically being uh, profiled and I don't know, this is like a very raw example, but it's not as much sophisticated than this at the end of the day. Yeah. So then, also there is like all these processes um, that happen beyond the interface, you know, uh, those algorithms that work, all these surveillance uh, tracking scripts and a lot of things that happen beyond the interface that is much more that happens in the interface and that we are not aware of, yeah. And those things have also like a massive environmental impact that uh, it's not really publicly, it's not in the public uh, arena and it's something that it's hugely critical, especially with the race of AI right now. So I just launched this project last week. Um, and uh, well, this it's called The Hidden Life of an Amazon User. And well, it's this project. And I'm going to talk about it now. Oops. Yeah. So everything again started when I purchased this book. So this book is called The Life and Lessons and Rules for Success, and there is like an incredible long subtitle that I can't read here because it's just too small, um, about, uh, well, Jeff Bezos, yeah, who is the CEO of uh, Amazon. So this book, uh, even though it has super long title, it's just 62 pages long, and there's a font type, it's just like 20 points, which is massive, and the separation between lines is just like two or three points, which is ridiculous, right? Uh, and it's not even written by him, it's not being written by anybody, there's no author. Yeah? Uh, and one of the best tips that he has to give is sleep eight hours. Yeah. That's uh, <laughs> quite interesting, like, okay, thank you, yeah. Um, so what I did, I just tracked uh, all the interfaces that Amazon made me go through when I purchased this book. So it was a total of 12 interfaces. Yeah? So here we have them all. Uh, like I purchased the book, then I've got some suggestions, and then a review of the book, and then more suggestions, and then shipping details, and then signing in, and then, okay, now we'll, more suggestions, and then, okay, go to the um, basket and just pay and choose your shipping options and pay and uh, choose a billing address again. Uh, okay, everything is all right, and more suggestions, yeah? So that was the minimum steps I did. I didn't click on anything else. I didn't look for anything else. It was the minimum. So it was 12 interfaces, but there was, I could track, also I tracked all the code and all the requests that were loading during, uh, during my purchase, uh, and it was almost 9,000 pages of written code, yeah? So this mapping, so we have like, 62 pages of Jess Bezos, 12 interfaces, <laughs> and 9,000 pages of code. And at the end of the day, like this code is what puts like the Amazon business model at work. Yeah, uh, Amazon business model is um, focused on obsessive customer focus. 
uh, which basically means, well, to put it a little bit uh, blunt, just track everything you can on the user and personalize as much as you can so they will just uh, generate more revenues for us, right? And that's the whole thing about this project and the idea behind it, which uh, I calculated also the amount of energy needed or that my computer used to load all these scripts that I didn't want to load and it was completely involuntary. It was a total of 80 megabytes, a little bit more. Um, so what this project is talking about is about that it's not that just um, Amazon, and this also affects all the companies, not just not Amazon, but I think Amazon is a pretty good example. Like all this free labor uh, that is being monetized, yeah, and ultimately, I mean, all the stuff that we do on the site, all this data that is being collected on our activities being monetized and generates revenues for Amazon, not for us. There is also the energy cost, or part of the energy cost and the um, further environmental footprint of such activities also fall on the user, a part of it. Yeah, and a part that, uh, that we cannot choose not to have it. Yeah, and it's something that we not tend to think about it in, in those terms, but it is because all these scripts and all the energy needed to load all these scripts happen in my computer, in my browser. Yeah? So, well, that's the project. So you can see like the 12 interfaces here. That's the first. Megabytes counting, watts hour counting, kilocalories counting. Uh, that's quite a lot just to reach the second interface. I mean, the whole thing, it's 14 minutes scrolling, if you do it patiently. <laughs> Um, like all these 9,000 pages of code. Uh, but yeah, that tries, I mean, this project doesn't really try to calculate exactly the amount of watts hour because it's really hard. And this, uh, I calculated during like a specific period of time. I was in the Netherlands, I was using this computer, it was specific time of the day, it was June. Oops, sorry. <laughs> Thank you. Um, but it's about to reveal like this, and it's a little bit of to hack like the current narrative on surveillance, right? Uh, that surveillance is quite energy intensive and has a huge environmental toll and part of it falls on us and there is no tools that we have in our hands, legal or whatsoever, that, to stop this. Yeah, and I think this is critical to approach surveillance in that sense. So I think that's it. We can keep on, thank you. <laughs> Okay, so I have uh, three questions for you, <laughs> and then we can open to the public. Um, I mean, I was reflecting on your presentation, and of course, also, uh, after seeing the film of before and listening to you, what would come spontaneous would just be, why are we even using this platform? So why we are giving for free all our data? But we also know that even this, uh, you know, should be the right question, then, uh, many of us will keep using this platform. So I don't think that the right approach is just to say we should leave because unfortunately it's never going to happen, at least now. So I'm trying to see the things on the other angle and maybe ask you, um, for example, assuming, uh, speaking about uh, the dating uh, apps, uh, that uh, people will be using them for various reasons that uh, we can imagine, um, what would be your advice uh, uh, for the people to try to use this platform consciously and also be conscious of their own data protection? So this is one side of the question. And the other one is also what uh, Christopher Wally was saying, uh, and I want to know what you think about that question that was given to him. Uh, can you do targeting in an ethical way? <laughs> um, so, yeah, I would like to ask uh, these two questions that in a sense are, you know, considering the subject from two aspects that are related. So, uh, it's complicated. I mean, it seems like easy, but it's not, right? Because what you said, we can't just stop using this because you stop using this uh, and then there is not a lot of people that start using this. We should start uh, stopping using this in, in a community way because then, you know, we can take our community somewhere else. But if it's a uh, responsibility that falls in the individual, it just isolates you. It makes me very depressed because you can't really solve anything, right? Um, it's tough, but I think that, you know, that 
those companies have to be held accountable of what they are doing uh, and they should just uh, propose much more responsible and ethical uh, users of their platforms. Uh, and of course they have to make money out of it because you know, that's why they are in business, uh, but not abusing uh, the user as they abuse it now. But still, this, uh, I mean, this is a political thing and I think it has to be resolved in a political level and there has to be laws that protect the user much more. And it, it, that it can be easy for the user to ask for protection because I think like the legal mechanisms that we have now they are very energy exhausting for the user to reclaim their rights, right? Mm -hmm. and, and this is very problematic. And um, for the second one, ethical targeting, Pfft. no, I don't think, <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> Really, because I mean, it's as they can tell you, yeah, well, we are doing targeting to fight climate change. Well, yeah, right, but how, you know? And I think this should be like a, there is a lot of um, decisions here that have to be taken collectively, right? It can't just be the, somebody just deciding for everybody and that's like, yeah, the usual problem. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And speaking about the second project related to Amazon, uh, I have a bit of a geeky question. I'm just interested in uh, how you could uh, uh, get these results. So, for example, how did you track the code that was being loaded? I'm interested in how you achieve all these codes that you were showing to us. I mean, this is just, I mean, it's not that geeky at the end because you can really access this through the browser. Yeah, so you just go to network activity and you understand all the requests that are being done. It's more like a tedious work of going, you know, like request by request, going to the page, uh, copying all the code, pasting it in a text file and, and this, but you can, you can really track what is very hard and what we discussed, it's to understand what those scripts are actually doing. Yeah, because those scripts are being written probably not just by one developer, by a group of developers in the different period of time. And yeah, I mean, if you try to understand what 9,000 pages of codes are doing, well, good luck. Probably by the time that you understand or you figure it out, they would have changed the whole website. So, yeah. It's very cryptic and it's very obfuscated, even if it's there and you can read it, but it's, it's not accessible. Mm -hmm. I would say this also says a lot about the culture around this platform that also the code is really difficult just to access and understand. Um, and then my last question before opening to the public would be, um, I found really interesting that uh, this project uh, you just uh, launched about uh, Amazon is also concerned uh, with um, the climate uh, exploitation that is uh, usually you know, a connection that doesn't happen so often about uh, data abuse and climate exploitation. Uh, so I wanted you to elaborate a bit more on that uh, and in which uh, way the two aspects are related, if you can say a bit more. Yes, yeah, so our current data economy is basically based on data collection at large, right? And all the processes uh, used to collect data at large, they have like a very, very heavy energy consumption. Um, it is expected that by 2025, like ICT, Information Communication Technologies, which also includes data collection, uh, connect services, connected uh, devices connected to the internet, and so on, will consume 20% of the global energy production, which this is massive. Yeah, so that's, that's why it's completely linked. Yeah, and I feel it's quite crazy that we don't see this connection and that it's not in the public sphere. They're discussing and trying to find ways to uh, to make um, more sustainable wealth. <laughs> I, I would never talk about sustainable surveillance, right? We shouldn't talk about that. But um, I know, like, really to make like all this data ecosystem much, much more sustainable, uh, which I think. It, uh, we need to go through, like, stop surveilling, stop data collection, and stop many other things. Yeah. But that's very utopic, of course. Mm -hmm. Thanks. And uh, now I would open to the public. There is already somebody there uh, on the, the first one. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Um, this is about the online dating profile thing. So I understand, okay, they're profile sharing so that they can buffer up other websites. They have new singles, as it were. But my assumption is that if people are clicking through and finding these profiles, so for example, someone uploads a profile onto OkCupid okay and then it ends up on Plenty of Fish or whatever. But if someone clicks on that, then what happens there? Does it just sort of go dead? Because obviously that person is not a, a member and so is not mm -hmm. 
communicate you can't communicate with them right yeah so there is this uh, research that was done in 2013 by a journalist at the bbc i came across it uh, while i was doing this research and she also bought profiles and she counted the people in the data set which I didn't want to do because I think it's very perverse to do that. Uh, but yeah, exactly. She uh, just found people that their profiles were in several other websites. And no, it's exactly it's like ghost profiles. Yeah. So they just, so no. if someone tries to message, sorry, so if someone tries to message them, it just. Yeah, exactly. I mean, some of them, if the email was real, then they would get the message. But if the email wasn't real, because a lot of times the way these profiles are assembled, they're just fake emails and all the rest might be true or not. Yeah. But, um, but then, yeah, if the email was correct, they would get the message. But that means they would get the message, sorry, sorry that means if the email was correct, they would get the message from the other dating site, yeah. the one they were not registered exactly. at. Exactly, yeah, yeah. Uh. There was another close to you, there on. You mentioned the code that you got, and I want to say that uh, there is a license called Human Turn AGPL that restrict no, it says, it says the following, you are not allowed to kill, to torture, and to monitor without consent, otherwise AGPL. And it is to solve, for solving also such issues, it's to put for open source developers the obligation not to survey, etc. So I think it's connected to the issue. What you think about? But, but then what is the question? Yeah, the question you is what you think about tackling the problem by licensing humanitarian values in the open source? Humanitarian values like no, oh. no tracing as a part of the licensing for open source. Then, when whatever code you would write in, in GitHub will be, when it would be used, it will not allow to be used for tracking uh, such people the way you found. And that will be a way to allow us programmers uh, to participate in the fight against uh, tracking, etc. Oh, well, yeah, it could work, you could try, but I think, um, I mean, there has to be a much wider law, uh, because, la yeah, I mean, those companies, they do things that are already illegal, right? And the thing, yeah, maybe there should be, like, more, I don't know, how you call it, not, uh, auditions, uh, more thorough additions, but still, it's very, it's, it's really complicated. It's not an easy problem to solve that. I think it, it can't just be solved with a license. I mean, I think it's starting point, but it's, it's, it's very complicated to monitor this, to regulate this, yeah. Because as I said, code is, can be obfuscated and it's just so hard, you can do whatever you want here. And then you need somebody that will read this and by the time that everything, you will understand what will happening, somebody else, uh, probably would change the code already and here, you know, like law is much more slow than technology in that respect and that's a problem. Hmm. Yes, so we're there. I see another issue here that when you mentioned about um, not using anymore the services uh, being utopic, but in the same time, and if we look at Amazon or Facebook and big platforms like that usually come from US and raise the question like why Europe cannot provide this kind of alternative to those services and some of the things that I know about is that many startups are, uh, that are born in Europe are bought by US companies and the investment that happens in Europe in this kind of initiatives are very low, so many people that uh, uh, want to innovate in, the, in these areas go to US to get bigger fundings and so on. So I think this is another interesting question related to policies and investment in Europe, why so many things are uh, developed in US and not in Europe, and we are basing all our 
activities in digital life, at least on US platforms. And the question was uh, more, <laughs> related, more related to uh, investment in Europe and supporting alternatives and why it's not happening. I'm not specialist no, not in that <laughs> issue at all. It's just an observation. To but I find it uh, an interesting observation also because then we just go back uh, to the history of the internet. I mean, also we all know how it was created. It was also part of a military program. Um, I think, uh, you know, this is more a geopolitical question and we should start speaking about the history of technology. So maybe we don't go there. <laughs> but uh, while we also wait for another question, I had, uh, you know, I was reflecting and I wanted to ask you, uh, since uh, this work you were doing on the data brokers also was commissioned by Tactical Tech, and then you published your results, and there was a debate. I wonder uh, how was the result uh, from, you know, the public opinion after you publish your investigation? Um, do you know also if some people approach this company uh, to acquire more information to? Uh, push for more accountability, uh, what, is, what was the feedback? So the feedback and this tactical tech took part of uh, the legal aspect of it because obviously I couldn't do it um, and I have the power to do it and the means. So we received an email from my group. Um, it, it was a little bit strange, it was a little bit ambiguous because they said that a lot of things were wrong but they couldn't really prove that we were wrong. And then they asked us to change a couple of things that it didn't make any sense, so we didn't change them. Um, and then we also asked them a lot of questions, you know, like we were in conversations, um, like, okay, say that they didn't collaborate with US, they didn't give plenty of fish data to uh, the US state org website. But then what I asked them, it's like, okay, but then there's been a serious data breach here that somebody needs to be responsible for, and I think it points that it should be you. Uh, they never answered to this either. Um, so it stopped at that, like a little bit, they were a little bit threatening, but we didn't defamate them. So they, they didn't have anything. Yeah, uh, so they started, I think they wanted to keep this under the water as much as they could. So then recently, uh, somebody from Tactical Tech sent me last week or two weeks ago um, an open letter to Match Group, uh, that it's a grassroots initiative. So there is an, like, an open letter to Match Group to demand accountability and, and to um, yeah, to understand what's happening with the data and, and so on. Uh, the idea mentioned that it had any relationship to the project, but my guess is that some sort of, uh, yeah, because Nobody did, there no such study on the online dating industry, especially match group, as the way we did it. Uh, so I believe it had some impact. Mm -hmm. And other questions? Yes, over there. I was wondering if there is a visualization of the physical mapping of the shipping and logistics of what happens, you know, when you order products from Amazon. Because I think it would be really interesting to see the footprint of that in relate, like the physical terrestrial footprint in relation mm -hmm. to the digital footprint that you've created. Yeah. Um, and I just was wondering if you knew if there is anything out there. No, I don't. But good luck making Amazon disclose their uh, footprint because they didn't want to do it uh, last year, uh, and they're really not transparent in this. Yeah which is super problematic because they are one of the biggest companies. They own 40, 30 to 40 percent of the cloud computing uh, industry, so that's massive. Further questions? One there. Uh, thank you so much for your presentation. I'm part of a group, Berlin versus Amazon, that just launched about a week ago. And uh, we were struggling with like how to visualize uh, the climate or the carbon impact because you have the AWS services and also the logistical side. Uh, one thing I was curious about, if you could comment on, is for many companies, including Amazon, I imagine the data speed, for example, 3G, 4G, 5G factors and much more in terms of how large a website should be. So have, what are your thoughts on like the 5G introduction to Germany from an environmental perspective? Because I imagine for many websites, it'll be the incentive to be slimmer. 
Well, I don't know much of 5G. I just know it's going to probably be traumatic for the environment. Like I read this article recently. We're talking about today about this today in the workshop. Like uh, the average um, amount of data produced by user through 3 and 4G networks was around 2 gigabytes per day. And with 5G, it will like for 30 gigabytes. Yeah. And that's like, I mean, the world can afford this. This is so much energy, right? And I think that. Yeah, probably websites are just going to be heavier and they're going to load faster and we're just going to generate uh, a lot of other data that will need a lot of electricity to be uh, to allow it to exist. So it's not good. And we don't need it. <laughs> That's the whole point. We don't need this. I would say let's get the last question. If there is. Yes. Uh, this is a bit of a cheeky question because it draws on something that you said at the workshop this morning. But you were talking about uh, the gradual privatization of the internet backbone and the relationship between that and the problems around net neutrality and the essential kind of two tier system emerging where people will stop being able to go to. Uh, kind of the smaller, possibly more activist or more socially focused things, and but basically the internet becomes Facebook, Amazon, and Google. Mm -hmm. um, and, and you said something then, which kind of pointed to the first thing that Tatiana said, which was, so then we'll just have to all get off the internet and all set up our local networks and kind of find ways to connect our kind of local internets up. Um, and I think this is, yeah, so that links to Tatiana's, like, we can't, all, we, obviously we can't all leave these things behind. But is it possible that that's the kind of way we might end up going? And uh, do we, um, I mean, talking to Sarah earlier, like the growth of uh, local community, uh, kind of Wi-Fi mesh networks, do we see the kind of seeds of something else growing that might just, combined with the dread of network neutrality kind of being lost. Do we, is, is there a possibility for that? I think there is. And uh, well, I'm, I'm from Barcelona and there is Giffinet there, which is like the biggest uh, uh, alternative or like independent ISP in the world. Yeah. Uh, and they're really resisting a lot of, uh, I mean, the ISPs, like telecoms are trying to buy them out. And they're really resisting. I'm not sure for how long they will afford to do that. But uh, totally, I, I really think that this is a possibility. But again, I started my workshop by saying this quote from Bill Gates, like, uh, uh, power in the uh, digital age is about making things easy. Yeah? And to run like a self-hosted <laughs> internet, it's a lot of work, it's a lot of commitment, it's a lot of times, and obviously it slows things down. And I think it's a pace that we are not used to. So it's definitely a possibility, but it should be like a stage uh, transformation. I don't think it can be just one time, and probably we're going to do that when we are going to be forced to do that. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> global history, right? Yeah. Yes, and so I would like to conclude our conversation by also giving a tone of hope from my dystopian way <laughs> of starting my, my question, and I think uh, uh, also we saw before with Transparency International and Transparency Germany that it's still possible to battle complexity. And so I think, uh, uh, you know, in a sense, uh, we should also say that uh, the resistance we are trying to do here is also to understand complexity and work with that. So maybe even the, uh, you know, the alternative solution is more complex. I still feel that we have this conversation also to understand better complexity and use it and uh, in a sense uh, hack it. So let's finish with this uh, positive tone. <laughs> and uh, thank you, Johanna. And thank we you. will then have... <laughs> and uh, after our conversation, we will have other 10, 15 minutes break. No, how many? There is no break. Ah, no break. <laughs> okay. <laughs>
So we go on again with the other conversation. And so thank you for the questions and thank you again. And thank we leave you. the stage to the next. Thank you. Thank you.